Well, Shalom Aleichem. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Superheroes of the Messianic Lifestyle. My name is Daryl Weinberg, and uh, we are broadcasting to you from uh, the Niagara region of Southern Ontario here through the LAM Network. Uh, on this show, we what we do is we interview someone who has been walking this lifestyle now for a while and has worked out some of the kinks so that we can be an encouragement to you because what we want you to know is that you're not alone. There are many who God is revealing his plans to and um, each of us has a different story to tell and a different journey. And I know that today's guest will be no exception to that. Uh, uh, his story will be uh, an incredible encouragement to you. So I want to introduce everybody to John Reed Austin. Hello, John. Hi. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me come on today, Daryl. It's uh, a pleasure to do so. We seem to be having some feedback again. <laughs> I hate that when it happens. All right. Well, maybe what we can do is we can just mute your mic until you have to share something. Okay. So while I'm speaking, here, let me do it. There we go. So while I'm chatting, um, we uh, it won't feed back, and then when you're talking, hopefully there won't be any feedback. So, um, <clears throat> you've been with uh, or you've known um, Mark David Smith for uh, probably about seven eight years now, uh, and uh, you met at the uh, the Sukkot uh, celebrations down in Oklahoma through Monte Judas Ministry, and it's kind of led you on a journey. And um, what we're really interested in knowing is. Uh, how did this all come about? So talk to us a little bit about, you know, how did you grow up in a Christian home or is it uh, something that you came to later on? And when did the light go on? When did the transition to a messianic lifestyle start? Okay, so thank you. Uh, that's, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, you have to go way back to when I was very young. Um, I always had been a very inquisitive person finding uh, things that just didn't add up. Uh, like how come you can't get three days from Good Friday to Easter was one of them. And how come Santa Claus is not in the Bible? <laughs> so those are sort of fundamental questions came to be. And then my dad was teaching Sunday school. And by the way, he's not in Torah, but he is a scholar of the word. And he taught me how to study. And he uh, was the one that introduced me to what was called the divided kingdom. So that would lay the groundwork many years later that would bring me into Torah. Uh, so then, uh, you know, I was raised in an evangelical, non, you know, non-denominational type of uh, congregation. And I was always, I even went to a Christian school for a while. Uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, just starving for uh, good uh, musical training. Uh, so I started playing clarinet when I was uh, about nine years old and had private instruction with the um, clarinet master. So I learned a lot of fundamental skills about having order in my life. And one thing about music, it teaches you order, kind of like the Torah. And so I had to practice those scales. And, and uh, so these were sort of things that really just kind of laid the groundwork. Uh, and then we shift forward many years later. Uh, that uh, I was uh, on my own and I went through, uh, well, I moved out of Colorado where I'm in Denver, Colorado. I moved from there to Nashville, Tennessee. Thought, you know, maybe I can make it as a musician there and come to find out saxophone is taboo in, in country music. So no room for me there. So I ended up uh, going to Louisiana for a couple of years and was mentored by a pastor. And while I was there, his associate pastor was a missionary and did a lot of uh, trips to Israel. And he and his wife, uh, they used to do the Shabbat in their home. And they invited me. And I had said to them, you know, if I ever go back to Colorado, I got to find me a rabbi. And, uh, and I think I know one who's messianic. And I'm, if I get married again, I'm going to keep the Shabbat. And the door opened for me uh, within those two years. And I came back to Denver, Colorado, and I did hook up with that ministry and have been there for 
uh, since 2004. So what is that? That's almost 19 years, 18 years now. And I got married under a hoopa uh, with my wife from Guatemala. So uh, that's kind of how the journey started for me uh, in Torah. And it wasn't overnight. I, it, it's kind of a process of uh, progressive revelation. Uh, I, you know, the, the number one thing was is that I was seeking for Torah. I just didn't know how to spell it. I, I didn't even know much about how to keep a Shabbat except for what I learned in Louisiana. And, uh, but I really didn't know the walk of Torah. So I thought, you know, I'm going to stick this out for two years. And the light came on in that two years. Uh, the Lord just said, you know, just, just stick it out. I know it's a little strange, but I promise you it's going to make sense to you. So I was very um, consistent in going. And the, the light came on when the, the rabbi was teaching about Lazarus being raised from the dead. And that this was a prophetic picture of us, that we have been dead in our lifestyle and so uh, there just he, go, he went into incredible depth about it and i got the recording and but i remember that day he started talking about the tribes of israel being divided and i remember what my dad taught in sunday school and i said oh this is making sense now and so from there on the, the floodgates opened i became very knowledgeable so much so that I was becoming a Torah terrorist. And so I had to kind of learn how to tone it down. And, and that's when my wife came in. She knew how to deal with me. And she's worked with a lot of Jewish people. So that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah brought balance. So yeah. go ahead. The, uh, I, I find that a lot of wives, their job is to say what he really meant to say was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of wives out there that are doing this when their husbands come to Torah. We came to Torah together. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so um, you, you, you've you come to Torah and uh, you've got this um, this new path that you're on. Now, your wife is from Guatemala, so uh, I'm assuming you, you've worked on your Spanish a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Spanish. I know more Hebrew than I know Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know that. Um, okay, so, you know, so are, now are you leading a congregation or are you part of one right now? And... Um, you're you're flying off to Guatemala fairly soon, so obviously you do some ministry down there. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, you know, back in 2020, uh, I was um, still doing a lot of uh, playing at nursing homes and a couple of restaurants. I had been doing that for about a decade or more. I think I was it was at the 14th year, and so when the pandemic hit, everything shut down. So my wife and I, we had already been giving to a ministry in Guatemala uh, for grandparents that had been abandoned by their families. They didn't want to take care of them anymore. So we thought, you know, maybe what we should do is we should just reinvent the wheel here. Uh, you know, I can't go to nursing homes anymore, so we've got to make money somehow. So we thought, let's put together a ministry, and we decided to call it Wine, Oil, Bread for Heart. And then we created a website also, which is wine, oil, bread, and the number four heart.org. So we, we got established and everything. And I already had a teaching ministry that I had been working on since I met Mark David Smith. So that was, you know, I had a good foundation going. And uh, I wasn't broadcasting uh, during this time with him. I was just doing some YouTube stuff. And then uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon discovered me and says, hey, how about teaching some classes and so I started doing his Zephyr Academy. And then, uh, of course, the same week, Mark David Smith calls me up and says, hey, uh, would you like to come back on where you have TV now? So I said, okay, sure. So that was just last March. Um, and uh, so we've been uh, traveling to Guatemala and Mexico where we have two ministries that we are uh, building right now. Uh, we've done everything from 
uh, build, building a, a church, enlarging it, and uh, building an orphanage for the grandparents. And we, we send food to them and, you know, through the, the lady that runs the organization. Uh, and we have a lady in Mexico. She runs a popular diner. And we're rebuilding her house so that she can bring kids that are street children and give them the gospel message and, and give them food a couple of times a week. And so um, we, um, uh, we also uh, go, I do open air concerts with wireless technology because uh, they don't have electricity in a lot of these places. So there's these kids that live uh, in landfills and in the hundreds. And so I, I'll do live concerts for these kids. And then there's a pastor that we help support there and uh, get some clue, uh, clothes and food. And we, we put it in a trailer that was donated to us. And we go out there two, three times a year as the money is supplied. And, and like, like you said, uh, we're going to be going to Guatemala uh, in just a couple of weeks. The 22nd we fly out there. We'll be there for about two weeks. And we're going to be meeting uh, some uh, stateside uh, ministers that have their own Messianic congregation there in a city called Huehue Tenango. And we discovered them through a family member. And uh, so we became really good, close friends. And they're going to be helping us with this ministry in another city where this orphanage is for grandparents. And uh, it's a place called La Tinta. Uh, so uh, that's how things have been going. And you know, our ministry has just been growing. And, you know, me doing concerts and now with me releasing a new CD. Here, I'll show it to you. This is... Uh, Wake in the Fire just released a couple weeks ago. It's not available online unless you go through our website, but uh, it will be available very soon. I'm trying to work out the kinks on that. Okay, well, that's super. Um, so you're you're quite active down in Latin America now, and obviously working on your Spanish and your Hebrew and <laughs> and all that. So. Uh, Tell us a, a, a bit more about the music ministry. I mean, it's not often we get to to chat with someone who's actually a, a professional musician. Um, how did God speak to you through this? I mean, playing the, the clarinet uh, and, and the saxophone isn't normally the first choice that a, lo a lot of young men, I mean, a piano or a guitar or something like that. How did you get to the wind instruments and then how did God sit? Now, I'm sure you do a killer klezmer uh, concert, um, but, you know, tell us a bit about that journey there. Okay. I'm so glad you asked that. It, um, you know, it's, it's actually a very funny story. Um, when I was in the second grade, uh, the music band director said, hey, if you'd like to learn to play an instrument, uh, talk to your parents and have them call me. So. My dad called and he, after about half an hour on the phone, he gets off and he says, well, John, he wants you to play the clarinet. And I'd never heard the word clarinet before. So I went, no, I don't want to play that big old thing. You know, see, I, and so I, I say, man, I have to carry this big thing to school every day. And so then we get to the music store and they open up this little black box and I go, hey, that's cool. I, I think I can handle this. You, you can carry so, that. Yeah, I excelled very fast uh, and um, took uh, private lessons with a clarinet master. He's still alive today. He's 86 years old. Wow. And uh, his name was Joe Lukasik Sr. And I'll tell you, he was a godsend. And so yes. he, he saw the potential in me that was very special. Uh, he'll tell you that. And I, I told him recently, I says, Joe, I wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for you. I mm. want you to know that you really mean a lot to me. And and what you've done for me. I said, you could have quit on me. One time he even said, you know, maybe you should be a plumber. And he slammed the door. And I used to slam the clarinet into the music stand. Oh, yeah. You know, every time I made that wrong note. And and I... It was easy to do with the clarinet. Oh, yeah. Slam. I used to <laughs> record myself doing that. Just so that I can release all the, the tension, you know. And yeah. So, uh, uh, that... Um, so, I, you know... And you know what's funny is my middle name is Reed. Ah, yes. <laughs> so, you know, God will give you a name and he'll cause you to fit the name. So uh, I started realizing, you know, maybe I'm supposed to be doing this. And so mm. I, I started to take up saxophone and I continued with clarinet. 
But I really started to find my place when I went to Colorado Christian University. I knew that there, I always felt like there was no plan B, that I didn't want to be anything else but a professional musician. That was from the ninth grade. But I knew that it was for sure when I went to Colorado Christian University to get my music degree. And uh, Joe always told me, he says, make sure you learn every kind of music so that if you go to a wedding, if it's a Jewish wedding, you got Jewish music. If, if you're going to go to a Greek wedding, you got to play Greek music. So I learned to play lots of genres of music. And, and so it, it um, turned out to be a good thing for me. And that's how musically I went into that direction. Now, while I was at Colorado Christian University, I took a music major degree. Um, and I also took um, missions as a part of that degree you know, because I wanted to be a missionary. Too. So I started traveling. I went to Indonesia five times, went to Mexico several times. Didn't go to Guatemala yet until I met my wife. And that was after we got married. Uh, but I realized that, that, you know, I always wanted to travel and, and be a musician and uh, didn't know exactly how that was going to look uh, until technology caught up. And now that I am fully embracing Torah, I have discovered that what God has wanted me to do is to give back to the people that are not in Torah. And so if I were to leave my current congregation uh, on a 90% basis, uh, just because ministry takes me elsewhere, I am solid enough in Torah that I can teach it. Uh, I can walk it out. And, but I can also teach the principles of Torah through music. And just without coming across as a Torah terrorist, and, uh, and use the music that has made America the greatest nation on earth. And that's why I came up with this CD. My producer and I, we got and we sat down together and we said, you know what? The, the uh, baby, not the baby boomers, but the, uh, the Gen Xers and, and the millennials, they don't know the hymns. And those are the, the hymn, those are the songs that made us the greatest nation. And now they're forgetting those hymns you can there is actually kids my daughter's age she's 12 i have a son who's 28 and i have, and he's married with a daughter and my daughter uh, is 12 years old and she will tell you that her best friend at a baptist school that she goes to does not know jesus loves me never heard of it if you can imagine that wow. and that's a classic hymn uh, I, uh, there's a drummer, professional drummer that plays in the band at the synagogue where I play, uh, and I'm on contract there. Uh, he plays the drums and he's very good and he plays a lot of churches and he will tell you, I've never heard eyes on the sparrow or even the old rugged cross. And so I said, that is that's wild. I, how can you not know that song? And I hum it. So that told me right away that it's time that we go back to some of the most beautiful songs, foundational songs of our faith and restore them. And I think it can be done while you're walking in Torah. So you have to be, remember what Paul said, I, I'd like to be all things to all people while saving some. <laughs> so we need to get some saved, if you will. And they're going to say something about you. What is different about you? And I'm going to tell them, well, you know what? I've gone back to my Hebrew roots of my faith. And it's just like the, how we need to go back to the roots of our hymn faith, the hymns of our faith. That's what it actually looked like. It said hymns of our faith. So there we are. Well, yeah, it's... Um... Music is a big deal for me because I've always been uh, very entrenched in it and uh, uh, love to sing. My uh, my father did some semi-professional singing. My aunt, my uncle actually uh, was a professional cantor for many years and also had uh, he did the wedding singer and all you know Neil Diamond <laughs> Redux. Um, but yeah, I music is such a huge part 
of our walk. And we also know that, of course, that it's being used uh, by the other side in order to draw people away because music hits us at the soul level. I mean, it, it, it bypasses all logic. And that's why it's so powerful. As a matter of fact, I have a couple of really, really great books on my shelf called Musical Truth. And it's all about the history of the, the globalists and how they overtook the music industry and what they use it for. And it's, it's absolutely insidious. But the fact that they, they were able to do that just shows you how powerful it is. And of course, you know, many of us have heard the expression that, you know, when Satan got kicked out of heaven and he fell to earth, he landed in the church choir because that's where you get a lot of your, 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 your politics and stuff like that from. But for me, I have been very disillusioned with a lot of contemporary Christian music. I find it vapid, self-serving, and um, it is really kind of indicative of the church culture that we have in North America today in general. Whereas if you go back to the hymns, there's a richness. Now, listen, you know, four four time and and all that stuff uh, with the, with the basic um, musical arrangement may not necessarily be your thing, but at least there's a richness to it. So at least you can listen to that and you can get some good theology. The same thing with messianic music. The reason why I love messianic music is number one because of the the whole Jewish heritage thing and. I think that's ingrained within our spiritual, or at least my spiritual DNA anyway. But also the fact that most messianic music is just simply scripture put to word, uh, put to music. Uh, for instance, uh, although I have no, I mean, I haven't done any musical training since I stopped taking band in high school. And yet a couple of years ago, the Lord had me write a song. And so I actually had someone um, who was a music major who actually composed it and produced the sheet music. But everything in that song is scripture. I don't have any of my own words in there because really, what am I going to say? And so you taking on this project and putting kind of a, a new twist to it, but bringing people back to hymns, I think is uh, incredibly powerful because music is reflective of the culture that we have. It is a real barometer. Um, or thermostat, as you were, uh, to, to help us to understand the spiritual condition. Um, there was actually a story about a Chinese emperor um, who he used to go around his, his kingdom, and the way that he used to evaluate the spiritual health of the different areas of the kingdom was he used to listen to the music. And if it was harmonious and if it was uh, beautiful music, then he knew that things were okay. But if the music became dissonant, if it became like, uh, you know, rap, <laughs> for instance, uh, he knew that there was a problem and he had to do some intervention. So I think that this project is is quite, uh, quite fascinating and uh, I think can produce some some great results. You know, uh, you mentioned dissonant and um, there was a project that I did uh, some years back prior to this uh, latest CD. And it was based on the Shemoni Ezra Amidah, which is the, the Lord's Prayer, the, you know, the 19 benedictions. And, and I had this uh, idea from a friend of mine. He says, you know, uh, I memorized the entire Shemoni Ezra Amidah and when I had liver cancer and I got healed from it. And he says, I've been thinking about giving back to all my friends by doing a CD. And I says, well, I'll tell you what, I've had a dream about taking something like that and take every Hebrew letter and make it into a note. And I says, can you imagine what the Shemoni Israel Da would sound like if it was sung? And he loved the idea. He financed the entire project. I got probably just a handful of CDs left now, but I've had people healed of cancer and, and just stuff like that. And so I, uh, it took me three and a half years to complete. And I thought, um, there was a guy by the name of Rico Cortez. You probably recognize the name. He says, have you thought about doing the song of Moses? And he did a teaching about the, uh, the 144,000 and uh, the song of Moses. And he was on a Paula White show. And I used to have his DVD, but I gave it away. But he talked about the original Sofegio, Ut Re Mi Fa Sol La, and the frequency of the, four thir um, the 432 instead of the 440. 440. 440. Yeah. And so I thought, 
you know, okay. So I've been actually, uh, I've got a, a producer and I, we want to do this. He's the same one that did my latest CD and we've been just kind of putting it on the shelf until we can get financing for it because it's going to be a very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not aggressive, but it, it's a very ambitious um, endeavor because we literally have to, it's going to look like a matrix of notes because you're just taking Hebrew letters and boom, you, you just transfer them into notes and then you got to make it into a form, choose a key signature and you have to structure it. And, and by the time you get done with that, then you, you hopefully you have something. And that's what happened with this other project, the Shimoni Da. It was just amazing how it turned out. And uh, so I've been wanting to do that and basically restore the original Sofagio through the Hebrew prayers and, and, and even with the Song of Moses. You know, it says that they, they don't know how it's supposed to be sung. Uh, so if only the 144,000 understand how it's supposed to be sung, who's that 144,000? And I'm thinking, wow, I could actually be the, uh, one of those you know, people that could actually do this. I, I have the desire. We have the technology. And I know how to do it. Uh, so, you know, all we have to do is just work with the technology and get it done. But it's going to cost a lot of money. So <laughs> if until it's cost uh, effective for us to do it, uh, that's waiting in the wings. So that's well, something we can certainly put to prayer. And uh, I certainly hope you're going to be uh, printing more copies of uh, your uh, your CD there, at least making it available for for purchase online. Because what's really fascinating is that the Lord had me a few weeks ago um, start. He said to me, start praying for alignment. And so we were talking about alignment, of course, in the spiritual realm. And he had me lay out an eight part teaching series that I'm in the middle of right now. So I do a, a broadcast on Lamp Network on Shabbat. Um, last week, um, I did a message on physical alignment and I talked all about these frequencies and what the healing frequencies were and what the uh, the you know, the, the the number of hertz and everything else. So it's fascinating that you're talking about this because it seems that the Lord is really speaking to this idea because you, you got to wonder, you got to wonder, John, you know, with um, modern medicine, which is run by some people who really aren't. Um, they're not really there for our benefit. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Well, as modern allopathic Western medicine becomes more and more detrimental to us, how is it that we're going to heal people? Well, it's going to be a supernatural thing. And we're going to go back to connecting to things that we have lost. And, you know, basically it all comes down to frequencies. It all comes down to vibrations. And if you can hit people with the right vibration, and if it's done through music, we're going to see people raised from the dead with this kind of stuff. And so, you know, this this excites me tremendously about what it is you're doing. And I don't know if that's something like that's crossed your mind or not, but it would be wonderful to uh, to explore that. So I'll. Yeah, let me um, let me go off camera for just a moment. I'm going to grab you the CD that I'm talking about. So hang on. OK, so. Uh, this was uh, done about, oh, maybe seven, eight years ago. And it's, you know, it's the Amidah. And on the back is the story. And inside, uh, it has the CDs with all the names on it. You can get this on our website, wineoilbreadforheart.org. So that's wine, oil, bread, the number four, heart, dot O-R-G. And you just go to the store and you'll have to scroll down. You'll see pictures of all the product that I sell. there. I've got teachings on Bible acrostics. I've got teachings about the stars. And, of course, I've got CDs. So I have a total of three of them. And this is the second one of the three. So if you'd like, I'll, I'll send you a copy. Just you need to give me your address. And... Yeah, that would be absolutely tremendous. And I'm sure I'd probably wear it out. <laughs> well, like I said, I've had I've had people. Uh, there was one man who was a stage four cancer, 
and he uh, we would go to his uh, doctor appointments with him and his wife. And the doctor would say, I, I don't see any new cancer here. Just totally wiped out. Um, and I told him, and he says, here's what you need to do because it may try to come back. As you need to continue listening to the CD on a, on a, at the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour of prayer. And, and you need to stop eating pork. And so he's okay, okay, okay. His hair grew back. He started going back to work. And then he had to go back to Mexico. And what did his family do to greet him as a homecoming? They had killed a pig. And he got off track and the cancer came back. And within a month, he was gone. So, yeah, I was really sad to see that happen. But, you know, I want him to experience the healing power and through that music. And I've had several other people that have uh, had amazing uh, healing experiences. But, you know, we need to understand that, you know, God, he's not going to just heal you and you expect, he, he, doesn't, he expects you to kind of, you know, carry on with the same order. You don't go back to where you were going to, you know, where you came from, because then it's just going to be worse than it was before. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we, hang on. We have uh, scriptural uh, evidence for that, where Yeshua tells the man who was sick and he healed him at the, uh, the, the pool of Bethesda. And he says, now stop sinning. Otherwise, it's going to be worse for you. So, yeah. And I, and I do understand what you're saying, because when I lived in Mexico, I had a business down there uh, back in the 90s. And um, my next door neighbor, um, there, there's one night I had, I had a few neighbors there and uh, two of them spoke English. Actually, one of them was married to a Canadian woman. And they knock on my door. It's like 10 o'clock at night. And they said, do you want to come with us? And I thought, OK, <laughs> this might be the last time anybody ever hears from me, but sure, I, I'm game for an adventure. So they ended up taking me to it turns out that it was like a slaughterhouse. And I'm waiting. I had no idea what we were doing, but I'm waiting around. And, and finally, um, we ended up with the prize, which was a, a pig. Um, uh Actually, no, sorry. He had gotten um, a two-month-old uh, piglet a couple of days ago, and it was sitting in the back. He kept it in the back of his truck, and he watered it. So we went to the stockyard to get a guy to slaughter it. So we pick the guy up after he gets off work. We come back, and they've got this big cauldron in the front yard because, of course, there's no grass down there. It's all, you know, concrete tiles. And he jumps in this, you know, short guy. He's about 5'4", big, wide chest jumps into the back of the truck. The pig goes, uh-oh, starts running around and he corners it and he kills it. And then he proceeds to prepare it right in the front yard. And I'm sitting there in my, in, you know, in my, uh, my front yard there having a brandy and coffee at three o'clock morning watching all this. But they had a big celebration a couple of days later. And, you know, I had to beg off because uh, I got to go to work, you know, I ended up spending the day at the office. But yeah, that, that whole pork thing is big. And in my new book, I have a whole chapter on why God said we're not supposed to eat those things that he deemed unclean. Yes. Uh, I went uh, to Indonesia one time with a pastor. And when uh, we, we went to this village of people, they were called the Siang people, which means afternoon. And when you say good afternoon, you say Salamat Siang. And these people had never seen a white man before. And the the mayor of the city, or of the province, I should say, uh, he took us by a three-hour boat ride to see these people. And when we got there, we had to go through a muddy terrain, and and they were all greeting us with their very unusual instruments that you poke under the ground, and it makes a boom, boom. And then you have a, about eight of them doing all of this boom, 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 boom. And so we come up to this gate, they call it the spirit gate. And it has dangling from the gate, all these things that are important that represent their culture. So, cause we're gonna do a cultural exchange. So we go through that gate, then we have to go through another gate. And I think we had to go through like three gates. And then when we finally get there, this woman who was apparently a witch doctor, she puts a blank over her head and 
takes egg and then some glass and breaks it and spreads around and she's hexing us and and then another one hexes us with a rooster or, or chicken or something waving it over our heads and and then we get, finally get to this cage and it has a pig and the pastor that was with us he was instructed to kill the pig and so he jabs it right into the neck and it squeals and it's bloody and fortunately we didn't have to eat that pig <laughs> but we, we certainly yeah pig I mean, in the cultures that are not in Torah, pig is the king. Uh, you know, it's heavenly ham, you know, and to them. So for us, it's lamb. So, but uh, anyway, yeah, that's. Uh, I I used to uh, when I was I was living in Louisiana for a couple of years, and everything there is unclean that you eat, if you can imagine. And I lived by a lake in the, in the town there, and crawfish was the big deal. There was even a restaurant that was hooked to a um, subway. Um, the, guy, the owner would do two things. He, would, he, he double dipped. And, so, and I would buy crawfish by the bucket. And this was way back before I was in Torah. This was back in 2003. So I'd buy them by a bucket, and I'd suck the heads and everything. And the next morning, I'm worshiping the, the porcelain pony. So I, um, I finally realized I don't feel very good. Very good. And so I thought, you know, maybe I should stop eating this stuff. And, uh, but th it was part of the, the progressive revelation. You know, everything God creates is good, but not everything God creates is food. So and, and my wife and I, you know, I got to tell you, for maybe some of you folks out there, you're still kind of hedging. Um, but... Um, We've had to give up just about every kind of restaurant there is, uh, especially Chinese food restaurants. I, you know, all these panda restaurants and stuff. You go, I guarantee you just about every one of them uses what is called, um, uh, they use a sauce. Uh, it's called, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, it? It comes from clams. And uh, they, they use this sauce in everything that they cook. So you can't even eat the vegetables. I mean, it's just, that's what they use all the time. If you ask them, they'll tell you. And uh, so we, because we noticed that before we'd leave a restaurant, we were having to go to the bathroom. We had the runs. And so what's going on here? So you know what happens is that when you start to make that Torah walk, that lifestyle, when you make that lifestyle change, your body adjusts and adapts to the, the kosher diet. And when you enter something that's foreign, your body reacts and says, what's this? I don't recognize it. Same thing with uh, fruits without seed, you know, seedless grapes. Everybody loves grapes, you know, and, but we had to give up all that stuff because we knew, noticed that it wasn't doing any benefit for our body. Uh, and so it's not something you have to do. It's something you get to do. If you kind of give it that sort of a mindset. And I like the fact that we can go into a restaurant and I look at the menu and I do this process of elimination and I can get it down. It makes it a lot easier for me to choose what I want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now it's a lot more fun. It's a, it's a treasure hunt. Oh, what can we eat today? <laughs> yeah, it's um, you know obviously I've I've been leading a, a, a kosher well biblically kosher. We got to make the distinction between rabbinic and biblical, but um, lifestyle for a long time, and it um, it does change things. And you know, in the book, I talk about the fact that. And many time, many uh, people within, you know, Christianity, they talk about unclean food and will say that, well, you know, it's unclean, but God made it clean. If it's not, um, if it's not clean, oh, hang on a second. Static. static. Go ahead. Yeah, you were getting a lot of static there. I think. Okay. All right. Seems okay now. Yeah, I've been sensitive here, but you know, we talk about um, unclean food, and that's an oxymoron. If it's not clean, it's not considered food. And so, when it says in Mark seven nineteen, it says that Yeshua declared all foods clean. Everybody says, "See, he, he you know, he cleansed." That would it says it's not food. He's talking about that which was permissible or that which was suitable for consumption, mm -hmm. and um, that wasn't it. So. 
So that's, uh, yeah, it's, and, and as we cleanse our body of these things more and more, our bodies become more sensitive to it. And as you say, if you reintroduce it, your body says, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Don't put that stuff in there. Yeah. And um, interestingly enough, in the chapter on food, I, have, I usually have a quote or two at the beginning of the chapter. And I quote, there's a doctor from Louisiana that says the Louisianans are the most unhealthy because they eat biblically unclean protein sources. Mm. So it just goes there to back up uh, what you're saying there. So talk to us a little bit about uh, the the ministry in Mexico and Guatemala. And, um, you know, what are your plans for that? And where do you see that going? What is it you get to do there? Like, are you, are you working with pastors who established congregations or how does that all work? Okay. So uh, the first one I'll touch on is the one in Guatemala. My wife was working for a bank at the time before we went to full-time ministry. And she was supposed to, by order of the bank, um, to choose a charity. And so she discovered a lady who was a Sabbath keeper and she was supported by a seventh day Adventist church. And, so we started giving to that ministry and it just kept growing and, and we have been almost exclusively the one that really caretakes for her ministry now. Her name is Sandra. And uh, so uh, what we've been doing is we've been taking our tithe money uh, and we send it to her, uh, Western Union or whatever. And, and she always tells us exactly every penny where it went. And uh, so we decided we were going to go visit her. And so we started visiting. She was showing us the need. And one of the things that she needed was to help uh, the orphanage that she had, where she houses eight people that are just left on the street and they have no place to go. Some, for some reason in this particular city called Latinta, they, the, the, the families, they take their mother or father and decide they can't take care of them anymore. And they just drop them off so that they can be lost. And so we find them just standing idle in the street, half clothed or whatever, skinny as a rail, look like they're going to die soon. So we take them in and we give them an opportunity to live out the rest of their life in a small little place uh, where they have a bed, they get food, they get clothing, they get a pillow and a blanket to sleep with. And, and some of them, they like a doll or a teddy bear. So we get them and, and stuff, you know, they people start to regress as they get older and they're like a little child again. So uh, and they don't last very long. They might last six months, maybe a year. Every time we go there, it's a whole new turnover, just like a nursing home. And uh, we actually have an on-staff nurse too that takes care for them. And the, um, the same lady has a church. Uh, and uh, so we've gone there to do performances and, and, and it was growing so fast because uh, she's real close to some villages where they don't have the gospel. And uh, so um, she outgrew the one congregation that we helped build and put a sound system in there. And uh, in one year, they had to double the size. So we were just there last year, late last year, to go see this new building that they built. And uh, so then uh, other places we go there in Latinta is we will um, visit uh, some of the houses where there are people who are invalid. Uh, one man for, in particular that I like to remember, he all he does is fix his cell phones all day, but his legs are dead. And they, uh, he can't walk. He fell out of a tree and broke his spine. So, But that's how he supports his family, by fixing cell phones. And he has these little parts sitting on a little table, he has no light. And so during the daytime, he's fixing cell phones. Now, shifting to Mexico, uh, we're able to drive there back and forth. We take a trailer full of stuff, you know, toys, clothes, even real essential things like diapers, flashlights, uh, you name it. Uh, and we just we send it over there and they just distribute them to these people in various places. And, um, and we have a lady who has a popular diner and it's, we discovered her through a friend and she uh, is also a member of a church that handles these uh, children that live in these shanty houses. I like to call them that because they just take, it's in a landfill. So they just take parts of whatever to make a little place to sleep. 
and uh, the, the it's a real desperate situation because they uh, worship the god of the dead and uh, this is a, a very common in mexico and so what happens is some of these kids they get abducted uh, they get sold or they get um, trafficked or sacrificed so there's a lot of this going on there and so we're trying to rescue these children uh, our next big project after we're done we're almost done with the um, popular diner the next big project we want to do which is going to not going to be cheap but it's going to be a community center for these children they have a safe house that they can go to and we can minister to them and they really just you know they're simple-minded people they you know they don't understand a lot about torah so you have to meet them where they're at and then build up their faith through you know principles and you know one time i went there i just taught them one hebrew word hazak <laughs> so you know, but uh, uh, so that's, we, we hope that, you know, as we're growing with this, that it will spread to other places, maybe even Israel or Brazil, you know, places like that. We'll just see how the Lord leads. But uh, uh, when I go, I always take my instruments with me and I have some uh, karaoke style backing tracks, professional backing tracks and I have wireless speakers that are a huge sound, fit in a little suitcase, and uh, I don't need electricity. I just need a place to charge them up, and they'll last for 11 hours on one charge. And uh, so I, I, pl I went uh, last year and tried it out. It was amazing. 300 kids, you know. And so uh, that's, that's, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. So that's what our ministry does. All right, as I switch back and forth here. Well, that's the, that, that's quite impressive. Now, um, is there any intent on perhaps moving down there one day? Because you said your wife is from Guatemala. Uh, or have you also got things going? Because you serve uh, in the, the congregation in Denver there in a Messianic synagogue. Is um, Do you have designs on maybe expanding that or... Um, where do you see God taking things over the next little while? We've got some dramatic changes that are happening within the world right now. I mean, the whole world is literally being turned upside down. And um, I think uh, Colorado, too, is uh, qu figures quite prominently in the battleground. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure spiritually what exactly that all means, but we do know, for instance, with the Denver airport and what they designed with that and everything else. So is, do you feel that God is leading you to continue and to grow the ministry uh, distance wise? Or is there maybe a move for you to go down to uh, to Latin America? Well, uh, as I said earlier, we have a, a ministry stateside in Guatemala that have decided to adopt the ministry that we've been supporting now after five years. And they are in Torah. And whenever I go down there, they always want me to do a concert and teach them things like the Hebrew alphabet. And, and they're very hungry for Torah. So they're really solid in, in, in believing in that direction. And it just so happens that Sandra is a Sabbath keeper. So uh, we've been slowly uh, just kind of easing her into Torah lifestyle. And she's taking that on little by little. Uh, so... You know, my wife is actually, she's been, um, she's been a, just yesterday or day before, she um, celebrated her 26th anniversary of being in the United States. And five years after we got married, which was 17 years ago, uh, she became a citizen of the United States. So she's actually lived here in the United States longer than she has been in Guatemala. We still have plenty of family there. Uh, so it's not easy to live in Guatemala, uh, you know, so uh, we probably, I'd say the chances of us picking up stakes and moving there, it probably wouldn't be to our advantage. We've got a covering outside of the synagogue, uh, an evangelical church that uh, is actually the oversight uh, is um, uh, Paul Wilbur, who donated a Torah scroll. Um, I have a lot of friends in Torah that go there, and the Lord showed me that I was supposed to go there, and 
turned out that some of these people I've known for 40 years. Wow. Yeah, so I, uh, uh, so we asked them, would you like to be our covering? And they were just about in tears. Says we love the Guatemalan people. We want to, uh, we want to be a, a giving ministry for missions. And so um, we almost, had, they were almost going to come with us, uh, but there were some loopholes that needed to be, you know, tied together for it to make possible. So they're not going to go with us on this trip. Maybe to Mexico, and maybe when some things uh, loosen up, uh, restricted wise, they're they're going to go with us to Guatemala. So we're building from that. Uh, the synagogue where I go is an organization also. And so they're, they have their own inreach versus outreach. So they have a different vision. And so for me to try to get them to get onto our vision would actually be a division. And so it wouldn't uh, be conducive. And so I, I see that ministry as my uh, foundational portion where that keeps me on track. Um, I didn't want to go to any evangelical church for fear that I was going to get off track. But then I realized how solid I am in Torah that, you know, I know how to discern things enough that I'm, I'm not going to go that direction. But there's enough going on at this congregation that we go to now that uh, I'm very um, comfortable with how they are being involved with our ministry. They've been huge. In, in giving to us, it's just amazing how I never thought, you know, when God told me to do that, I said, no, I don't know about this. But he said, no, trust me, you need to go to this congregation. And we've been going every Sunday since. And uh, so next Sunday, this coming Sunday, I'm actually going to do a full concert. They're giving me the entire service. And I'm going to do a concert. And they, they say, we, we want you to teach about what's going on with your ministry. We want to support you. It's just amazing, you know. You just you don't see that happen a lot. No, for sure not. Um, to get that kind of support is, is quite rare, and to have someone like Paul Wilbur uh, behind that is uh, that that that's a, some pretty heavy stuff. So, um, just quickly, with a couple of minutes uh, left. Um, where do you what what do you see happening for you in the next year is there something specific that's coming up do you have any plans for any more cds or what's god really laid heavily upon your heart now so yeah i the lord was telling me it's time to get back into music ministry and to carry the message of the hymns uh, this is just the first one. I think there's going to be at least two more that are going so to. How much do you need to complete that project? Uh, well, this is completed. This is that what you mean? Well, we're talking about the uh, the, the next big project that you were uh, looking at. Oh, okay. I'm going to do uh, maybe two more hymn CDs. Okay. Yeah, and it'll be based on this title, uh, but it's each time it's going to climax. So like mm. here it's Awaken the Fire. Maybe another one will be Kindle the Fire uh, and then maybe Inferno Fire or something like that. So <laughs> but we got to see how well this goes. I need to get to some churches. Amen. We need to wake up the, the, the Ephraimites, the, the evangelical churches. We need to show them that we need to get back on track. We need to save America. And mm. if you can take me to other countries as well. That's fine. Um, but, um, yeah, if you, anybody would like to get a CD to help support us, um, uh, this will get us on track to, to continue that. And, and then someday if God opens the door, uh, or when, uh, I would like to do the, the song of Moses. I feel that, uh, we've got maybe a couple of years, maybe more if God tarries, but I think, uh, there's going to be a great famine that's going to hit this land. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at famine in two ways. Famine could be. A hunger for God's word. Mm -hmm. But if you're not going to be walking in his teaching and instruction, it's going to be starvation for you. And so that's the other kind of famine. You're going to, it's going to be really tough to live in America. And, and probably for another seven years after, you know, in the next couple of years or so, we could see. It, you, I know it's bad now, but you think it's bad now? <laughs> it's going to be even worse. I, I look at it as kind of like a, you know, like a, you know, you're on a, a, a you're on one of those roller coasters, right? And you, you're 
getting up to the top and you know what's on the other side. You're going, oh, mm-hmm. no, I can't look. And you're going down, straight down. You think you're going to fall out. And then you get to the bottom. But then that's when it is going to be a real struggle to try to get back up again. And if you're not prepared, then it's going to be really tough for a lot of people that are not prepared. And so we need, this is some, one of the ways we can prepare, but we also need to have some teaching and instruction on how to walk on this earth. Amen. Well, John, we've, we've come to the end of our time. And I uh, want to thank you so much. It's fascinating. And what you say is from Amos 8.11. It said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, and not a famine of bread or thirst for water, but rather of hearing of the words of the Lord. So that just lines up with exactly what you're saying. Um, so you can um, you, you can uh, request a, uh, a CD and uh, encourage everybody. I'm looking forward to getting that CD. That, that's very exciting. So reach out to uh, to John's ministry and just tell us once more what that was again. Wine, oil, bread, the number four, heart dot org okay amen all right well john thank you so much god bless you and your wife and all the amazing work that you're doing uh, this has really blessed my heart and encouraged me and uh, i know it will be for other people so we want to thank everybody uh for joining us uh once again tonight for superheroes for the messianic uh, lifestyle and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week god bless you all and shalom shalom we are richly blessed to bring you what we believe is the fullest most diverse yet up-to-date progressive teachings discussion and prayer programming you can find anywhere on this planet be sure to take the tour of the messianiclamradio.com website i'm susan hoogie thanking you for joining us on the Messianic Lamb Video Network.